What we've been covering up to this point was really sort of a motivation for concurrency, what some of the benefits of concurrency are, uh, a few of the issues that can arise if you don't use concurrently concurrency properly, and so on and so forth. What we'll be doing today is starting a discussion of threads. So there'll be several parts to this. What we'll be doing here is we'll be talking about how Java threads can be used to support concurrency. And as you'll see, concurrent apps use Java threads to simultaneously run multiple computations that potentially interact with each other. Obviously, if you have an embarrassingly parallel program that doesn't have any dependencies, the threads don't interact with each other at much, if at all. But uh, in many cases, you actually do have interactions, and so threads have to worry about coordination. We'll talk about coordination and synchronization later. We'll talk right now just about what threads are. I'll also give you a quick overview of how our case study app works. Every one of these lessons has a case study app that we'll go and look at in some detail so you get a se sense of how to implement this code rather than just concepts and pretty pictures. We'll talk about Java code, and I'll show you stuff. And you can always go and download the examples and play around with them to learn how to do it. We'll talk about different ways of giving code to a thread. There's a couple different ways to do it. One uses inheritance, one uses implementing interfaces, and then there's a variant of the latter that uses something called lambda expressions, which we'll talk about. And then the last thing we'll cover in this part of the lesson is how to pass parameters to threads, which at first glance seems a little mysterious, but actually is pretty straightforward. So let's start off by discussing what Java threads are. So threads in Java are the most basic way of obtaining concurrency. There's other ways of doing threading in other languages. There's other ways of doing threading in Java, as we'll see. But the basic, most fundamental way of doing things in Java is to create a thread. And a Java thread is a unit of computation. In other words, it's going to be executing a bunch of instructions in an instruction stream. And it runs in the context of something called a process. So a thread is a unit of computation. And a process is a unit of resource allocation and protection. So as we'll see in a second, the thread is the thing that's actually doing the work. And the process is providing sort of the container in which to do the work. And the thing that's cool about processes is that anything inside a process has to be given special permission to get access to anything outside the process. So it's basically a way of protecting the elements inside a process from accidental or malicious attack from other processes that are running on the machine. Android, and Java for that matter, enables multiple threads to run in multiple processes. And if you take a look, you'll see that Java provides this support. Android takes advantage of it. And what you can do here is you can very easily have multiple processes, each of which is running multiple threads. And naturally, under the hood, all this stuff is going to be mapped to multiple cores if you have multiple cores on the machine. And there's a multiplexing relationship going on here. If you have n cores, you could have you know many more threads than there are cores. And the underlying operating system and virtual machines are responsible for adjudicating access and coordinating the access of those threads to the cores. That's really what an operating system is doing. It, one of the many things it does, that's one of the key ones. Java threads running in the same process, in other words, you have a bunch of threads running in the same process, can communicate with other threads in the same process either by sharing objects that are part of that process's address space or by passing message to it, messages to each other through queues. So those are the two most common ways of things within a process to talk. You can put things in static objects that can be shared between threads, or you can take messages and pass them around between, between queues. And we'll see lots and lots and lots of examples of, of uh, both those things, especially the latter case of message passing. That's very commonly done in Android. If you have Java threads that are running in different processes, either on the same machine or perhaps even on, on a different machine if you're connected to the cloud somewhere, then you can have them communicate with each other by other mechanisms. For example, on Android, at least, you can have shared memory that where you can share the address space between multiple processes. Android supports that. Java doesn't really support that, but Android does. And then you can also use something called inter-process communication. And Java has a couple different ways to do that. Android has a whole bunch more. We'll be primarily focusing on the way that Android does it here, but be aware that there's also other ways of doing it in a more Java way, uh, Java-centric way, not requiring any use of Android. So those are sort of different ways to communicate. Now, not surprisingly, it's a lot more complicated to communicate across process boundaries than within a process boundary. 
Yeah, good question. So the question is, when I say we're doing it in Java versus Android, how do those two things compare and contrast? So Java has something called the Java platform. And the Java platform consists of a couple of pieces. It consists of a virtual machine that runs on top of different operating systems. We talked a little bit about virtual machines earlier in the course. A virtual machine basically is used to give portability so you can run your Java code essentially anywhere as long as you have a correctly implemented virtual machine that runs on top of whatever operating system and hardware you've selected. And Java virtual machines run almost everywhere nowadays. So that's one piece of the platform. Another thing that the platform has is, of course, the Java language. And the Java language includes things like for loops and classes and if statements and inheritance and all this other good stuff. And we'll be talking a lot about Java. I'm assuming people here are at least uh, hopefully pretty familiar with Java. If you're not familiar with Java at all, you may want to take an earlier course. But uh, you should understand Java, the programming language, those are the kinds of things we typically cover in earlier versions of courses like our Android for Java course or other things you may have taken. So then there's, and then there's another piece called the Java class libraries, or Java class library. And there's hundreds of, of packages that are part of the Java class library layer of Java. And there's lots of things there. There's lots of graphic stuff there. There's lots of things having to do with accessing persistent resources like files. There's various classes in there for dealing with networking. There's a whole pile of utility classes for doing data structures, things like hash maps and array lists and all kind of good stuff. And then there's something else in there that we're going to spend a lot of time on in this class called Java Util Concurrent. And Java Util Concurrent are a set of concurrency packages that are classes that are part of the Java Util Concurrent package. There's actually a couple of packages. There's Java Util Concurrent. There's Java Util Concurrent Atomic. There's Java Util Concurrent Locks. And those are just different packages that have all the concurrency and synchronization related classes in Java. So that's all the Java stuff. That's Java the platform. And it's very standardized. People spend a lot of time on a compatibility regime to make sure it's correct and it's uh, portable and so on. Then there's Android. Now, Android incorporates, copies a lot of what's in the Java platform. Not all of it, but a lot of it. It has the bulk of the Java programming language. It has the bulk of the Java class libraries and so on. And then it goes ahead and adds a lot more stuff. And the reason it adds more stuff is that it's also doing other kinds of things besides what Java's doing. So it also provides support for the Android-centric way of doing user interfaces, the Android-centric way of being able to handle shared memory, the Android-centric way of being able to do concurrency. There's a whole set of libraries that are layered on top of the Java platform. And this course is going to cover both those things. So we're going to cover Java and Java 8, which has got a whole bunch of new, other cool new stuff. And then in various places, we're also going to talk about Android. So there's a whole big smorgasbord of stuff. And as somebody developing Android apps, which is what we're doing, of course, here, then ultimately it behooves you to understand the, the Android capabilities. If you're focusing primarily on Java stuff, then it helps to know the Java stuff. But you can think of them as, as building blocks. The Android stuff is layered atop of the, the Java stuff. And there's actually quite a bit of connection. The, the Android stuff is very tightly coupled and dependent on the Java stuff. But you can use Java stuff elsewhere. You don't have to be limited to just Android if you want to use Java. OK, other questions? So each Java thread, now keep in mind we're talking about Java now, not Android. Each Java thread leverages unique state from the underlying Linux kernel thread. So Linux kernel, the underlying operating system, has threads. And then there's other layers of threads. And Java has its threads, as we'll see later, implemented in the virtual machine layer or the exec execution environment layer. We'll talk about the differences between an execution environment and a virtual machine when we get to that part later in the course. And there's also then a Java class called Java Thread. And those things are all very tightly coupled in terms of the given Java platform or Android platform which, which they're running. And there's some state that the Linux thread has that's unique for each thread. So there are things like a runtime stack. That's what we see in the diagram. That's what those, those funky looking little rectangles are with the yellow uh, and blue rectangles in them. Those are, those are stacks of activation records, keeping track of the call chain that's taking place in a given thread. And each thread has its own stack. Likewise, each thread has its own instruction counter to keep track of where it is in its instruction sequence. And a different thread will have a different stack and a different instruction uh, counter, and they'll work independently. They don't share those things. 
And then there's also a bunch of other registers, like a frame pointer and other kinds of things, thread-specific storage, uh, entry points, and so on, that each thread will have that's specific to it. That's its unique state that's not shared with other threads. There's also some resources that a thread shares with other threads. There's certain things that all threads within a process, which is this unit of protection and resource allocation, there's certain things that all the threads share. And that includes dynamic memory. In other words, memory that's allocated when you say new whatever, right? That's dynamically allocated memory. And then there's also something called static objects. You can allocate memory that are st that's statically allocated, although uh, typically those end up being allocated at least partly dynamically when you need them. The, the few exceptions would probably be things like arrays of built-in types or something like that, which really could, in fact, be allocated entirely statically. And those things can be shared with the proper visibility, the proper, you know, the proper use of public, protected, private, and so on. Those things could be shared across Java threads. So this is common state. So that's one way to share stuff. You make it either you share it by allocating it dynamically with new and then passing it around, perhaps through a message queue, or you might have some static shared objects that different threads can synchronize and coordinate their actions upon. So just important things to remember that, that threads have dynamic and static stuff that's shared and then some stuff that's very unique to each thread. That's a quick overview of threads. We'll cover this in more detail as we go through the rest of the lesson. I want to talk now about the case study we'll be focusing on. So there'll be a case study that you can download here and take a look at. And it shows various methods in the Java thread class, like start and run and interrupt and so on. We'll get to all these different things later. And uh, current thread and stuff like that. And it also shows alternative ways of giving code to a Java thread. And as we'll see, one way to give code to a Java thread is by implementing the runnable interface. And another way to give code to a Java thread is by inheriting from the thread class. And you can take a look at these links here and here, and they show the different ways of doing this. And I'll talk through how they compare and contrast and why you would choose one versus another. It's important to have a good understanding of that as you get into Java, because otherwise you'll see code and you won't understand what it does. And threads are already a little mysterious enough as it is, and so you don't want to get confused by the syntax. So let's talk about a couple different ways of giving code to Java threads. So not surprisingly, you need to give code to a thread in order for it to run. If you don't give it any code to run, it's not going to do anything. Just like if you forget to call start on a thread, it won't do anything either. That's a common bug with Java is to create a thread, you get it all set up, you do something, you make, you say new thread, blah, 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 and your program doesn't do anything. You're like, what's going on? And it usually is because you forgot to call start. There are other reasons why it could be wrong too, but that's a common one. So there's all these alternative ways of giving code to Java threads. Let's talk through some of them. One way to do it, which is arguably the most simple way, because there's just one moving part, is to write a class, a subclass, that extends the thread class. So in this case, thread is a superclass or a base class. And you derive or extend or inherit a subclass. And then you have to go ahead and override the run hook method. So the run hook method is the thing that's going to do the work. That's what we call the entry point. By the way, a, a hook method is basically a method that can be overridden in a subclass in order to be able to provide some variable behavior. And we'll talk more about hook methods a little bit later. Very important concept. You hear me say the term all the time. A hook method, by, by default, all methods in Java are hook methods. If you say they're static, then they're not hook methods. So there's a couple other ways to get things not to be a hook method too, like make them private and so on. But if they're not given anything, if they're public uh, or protected, then they are hook methods. That means they can be overridden by a subclass. So that's where the threads computations are going to go. We'll talk a lot more about that later. Then, of course, you have to come along and make a new thread by saying new subclass name, new GCD thread, greatest common divisor thread. And then you start the thread. So that would go ahead and create a new thread, and it would go ahead and start running, and it would call the run hook method to, to begin to execute. And we'll talk more about that later. This is a way to do this with an anonymous one-liner. right? So if for some reason you don't like to write all this code, you can also do this, where you go ahead and just say new GCD thread dot start. The main downside with doing this is that you don't have any way to reference the thread you started. And so if you want to stop it for some reason, you can't stop it easily. You, you can stop it by 
doing very draconian things like shutting the process down or something from the task manager or whatnot, but you can't otherwise get access to it. So that's just a shorthand. You see a lot of code like this as well. The other way to do things is to implement the runnable interface. And what you see here is there's an interface that's built into Java called Runnable. And you simply go ahead and you instantiate it by implementing Runnable and overriding the run method. Implementing an interface is kind of like making a subclass, but it's got certain characteristics that are different from subclasses, especially in, when it comes to things like multiple inheritance. And we'll talk about that later. There's a couple of different ways to implement the runnable interface. Here's one way. One way is to make an instance of a named class as the runnable. So here you can see we have GCD runnable, which implements runnable. We write our run code here. We then go ahead and make ourselves a new GCD runnable. And then we go ahead and we take that GCD runnable and we pass that GCD runnable to a new thread. Now, in this case, I have an anonymous thread. I don't have to do it that way. I just did it to make it short. But I'm taking this thing, and I'm passing it as a parameter to the thread. And so what that's telling the thread is when the thread starts to run, run the runnables run hook method. So that rather than using subclassing from thread, we're implementing runnable, and then we're passing that as a parameter. So that's another way to do it. And um, Here's another way to do this. This is sort of the second way to do this. So this is, this is the first way. This is the red pill way. Now we have the blue pill way. And what we're doing here is we're making ourselves an anonymous inner class as the runnable. So as whereas over here, we made a specific named class, over here, we're going to make ourselves an anonymous inner class. You notice that we didn't make a special type. There's nothing unique or named about this. So you just plop the code right there. So, and then we say start. So that's a little bit more syntactically economical way of doing things. The downside, of course, is that we didn't make a separate class. So if we want to make multiple instances of this thing, we're going to have to keep repeating that code over and over again. Yeah? Um, the other one would be declared as final, but this one would be Oh, it, it doesn't matter. I could take final. Uh, the question was, why do we have final here? We don't have to have final there. I could take that out. Well, by the way, just so you'll know, final means once this thing has been initialized, it can't be changed. That's all that final means. OK, so that's one way to do things. So I think you'll agree with me that this is a little bit more concise. The downside with this approach, again, is if I want to be able to make the same code and use it in multiple places, I've got to keep typing this over and over again. So it just means more carpal tunnel syndrome or something like that, right? You read my mind. The, the question was, can we use a lambda expression on this code? And the answer is yes, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. This anonymous inner class idiom is very commonly used. So the reason I show it is when you first see it, if you're not familiar with it, you don't know what the heck is going on. So don't be surprised. This, this actually gets used in other places besides runnables and threads, but it's a very common idiom. OK, this is what um, Yifan just mentioned. So we can also use Java 8 lambda expressions. And this is basically just a variant of number 2. So a lambda expression, as we will see later, is a more economical way, a more parsimonious way of stripping out all the unnecessary syntax, like new, runnable, open, curly brace, public, void, run, open, close. All that stuff goes away, and it gets replaced with a very, very simple syntactic uh, form, open, close, paren, arrow, open, curly brace, and then the code to run goes here. So this is basically a lambda expression. It's essentially an unnamed block of code with optional parameters that can be passed around and executed later. What we're doing here is we're making a lambda. We're passing it to thread, and then thread will call back on its run hook method later, even though you don't see a run hook method, right? And that's by virtue of something called functional interfaces. We will cover functional interfaces in more detail later in the course. So the, the question here really is, what's a holistic perspective on threading? 
We'll get to that if you take a look at the videos that are linked in the assignment. You'll get a preview of that stuff, but we'll cover all that stuff in detail. I'll give the cliff note version here now is that the virtual machine keeps track of all these threads working in conjunction with the operating system. So the operating system, which in the case of Android is Android Linux, the Android Linux kernel allocates threads in the, in the operating system kernel. Then the virtual machine allocates some additional state in conjunction with the Java thread class. And we'll look through all that in more detail later as well. And what happens there is that all those threads are then managed by the, the thread scheduler of the operating system slash virtual machine. And they keep track of what's going on. Now keep in mind, all these things are running within one process. And if there's multiple processes, which there inevitably will be, especially on Android, then each process has one or more threads in it. And it's the scheduler's job to keep track of all that stuff, kind of like a traffic cop, you know, directing traffic, making sure you don't have collisions and everybody gets a chance to go at some point. And so it's the job of the operating system scheduler to keep track of all that stuff. And we'll talk at length about all those things. Ah, great question. So the question here is, what the heck is this arrow? So this is just syntax, right? So what this is saying is, I'm about to define a lambda expression that has no parameters, which is what run is like. If you think about run in a thread, it just run, open, close, right? There's no parameters. So this is what would be called, this is a, a function, functional interface. And it says, I'm going to define a lambda expression that has no parameters and arrow. Here's what it is. So just think of arrow as like, and I'm about to show you what the code should be. So at what point sort of define is going to be a So this says, this is a lambda expression that takes no parameters, open, close, paren. This is the implementation of said lambda expression. And that's the, the stuff that goes in the curly braces. So I mean, if you go back and take a look here, it's as if we went and got rid of new runnable open close, open paren, public void run, open close. We just got rid of all that and we replaced that with open close paren arrow. Um, so how does it know that uh, the run, uh, your path to the runnable, not something else? Uh, it's just that uh, class access, maybe another argument or class access? Great, great question. The question is, how does, how does the type system of Java know that this is a runnable? And the answer is, it doesn't care as long as it matches what the runnable signature expects. So the runnable signature is, is a, function, a function interface, which just has no parameters, open, close. And so as a result, as long as you have something that, as long as you pass something that has no parameters, it's going to think that's what you want to be run. Now, that obviously begs a lot of questions about, you know, will there be surprises from that? And the answer is yes, there could be surprises. So if you want to be more type safe, there's ways of programming with functional interfaces directly and we'll talk about that. We might talk about that. We, we, will, we will, in fact, talk about that as well. There's a whole module about that, too. If you take a look, there's a video up that's linked in assignment 1B that explains how Java 8 lambdas work. And we'll talk about it in class. Great questions. Other questions? We'll come back and talk a lot more about Java 8. Java 8 is super cool. And uh, there's lots more stuff that we'll cover. Now, the key thing to note here, it, lambdas are fun, but if you have lots and lots of code that goes into lambda, it can become a distraction. So lambda expressions are typically best used for very short pieces of code that do something very simple. If you have something more than that, you probably want to assign them to variables and then keep them and pass them around, or you want to just go back and define classes or imp implement interfaces. The next topic, passing parameters to a Java thread. So, the run methods that are defined in Java thread and runnable, so here's runnable and here's thread, you see both these methods, they take no parameters. So that sort of raises the question, how do you pass parameters to them, right? If, if there's no way of, if there's no parameters, how do, you, how do you give them something to work on? And the answer, of course, is it's quite simple to do. And there are two ways to do it. One way is to have a class that has a constructor and you pass the parameters that you want the thread to access to the constructor of the class. So let's take a look. This is an example that's from the, the GCD runnable case study that we'll look at in more detail as we go through. So here we have class, GCD runnable, extends random, implements runnable. And we're going to define some fields that needs to keep track of. Might have one or more of them. 
And then in the constructor, we're going to give the parameter we want to have passed in and stored here in the field. And then down in the run method, when run gets called after we create a thread and we give the runnable to it, then we're going to go ahead and call back to the activity, that's our field, M activity. We're going to call to the parameter instance that was passed in in the constructor and stored here. And that will go ahead and print the results. And then down here, you can see when we have our main, our main activity, where we're going to go ahead and make a new thread, we're going to make a new GCD runnable, which is the guy up there. And we're going to pass in ourselves as the parameter. And then that will get stashed up here in this field. So that's, that's one way of being able to do things. That's a pretty simple way of doing it. You create a class, you pass the parameters to the class, and then you have the class used to implement the run hook method. And we do it here by implementing runnable. Of course, we could also extend thread as well. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just a variant of this. It's using setter methods. So here we have GCD class. Or we have class GCD thread extends thread. Do the same kind of thing. We have an activity field. We have a private random field. And then we define a couple of setter methods to set the activity and set the random. And I, I did it this way. Notice something cool here. This is what are called fluent interfaces. You'll notice how each of these methods returns GCD thread. They return a reference to GCD thread. And they do their thing, and then they return this, which is the object for which they were invoked. And by doing this, by using this fluent interface approach, which you can read more about here, then you'll see in a second how we can use this. So here's the run method. This goes ahead and you know, calls the print, act, print method on the activity. It goes ahead and calls next int on the random. So it's using these fields that were passed here by the setters. And here's how we actually use a fluent interface style when we make an object. So we say new GCD thread dot set activity this dot set random new random. And so notice how all these things get chained together. And so we'll end up assigning the value of GCD thread to the thread local variable after calling these accessor, sorry, these setter methods to go ahead and set those fields. And because they each return the instance of the object for which they were passed, you can chain them together. And the final one returns the result, which then gets stored in thread. This is a very, very common idiom that's popular in Java and Android. People use it all the time. Yeah? So they get executed in reverse order? No, no. They get, well, they get executed first. The th first the thread object's created, because if that wasn't created first, then Havoc would, cre would break out. Then set activity is called on the thread object, passing in the acti main activities this. Then that returns this. Then set random is called. And the result of set random is then assigned to here. So these guys go here, 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 and then that result is assigned back to the thread local variable. Yes? Fluent, fluent interfaces, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, so the question is what's the, what's the origin of fluent interfaces? People have been using fluent interfaces for a long time. If you go and take a look at this Wikipedia entry, you'll see that it's been used in many different languages. The only thing you have to do is just return a reference to the object that the method was called on. So that's, that's not a Java 8-ism. People have been using fluent interfaces for a long time, well before Java 8, and, and other languages. It gets used in C++ <coughs> and other languages, too. In fact, uh, if anybody here has ever programmed in C++, C++ IO streams have a fluent interface a dimension to them as well, where you can chain together insertion and extraction operators using less than, less than, or greater than, greater than to kind of flow them all together in a nice fluent way. OK, that's the overview of Java Threads part one. <laughs>